Hello, I'm the regular Scottish Hatter. So what am I doing? Hey, hey, what what I think come on! I'm really sorry. Sorry. Yes. Thanks for joining me! What are you filming for? So recently I was given the opportunity to see a production of one of my all-time favorite musicals, The Secret Garden. This particular production was at the Toledo Rep Theater in Toledo, Ohio, and it was incredible. The Secret Garden is a musical that lends itself pretty well to the power of suggestion and imagination. By that I mean it's not entirely a literal telling of the story of the Secret Garden. That literal telling is there, but there are also a lot of symbolic and metaphorical elements to the story. A while ago I made my justification for my stage reviewing persona and I talked about the power of suggestion that theater can have that book and movie don't necessarily have as effectively. And you definitely see that with The Secret Garden, particularly with the inclusion of the deceased characters who are either literally or figuratively, you decide, haunting the living characters. And this particular production adds an additional element of suggestion because of the set. Generally the set for The Secret Garden is pretty ambiguous with elements basically just suggesting the garden and the house and all of these different sets. However, in this particular production, the entire story takes place in an attic. The set is a cluttered attic, and there's actually a frame story, a prologue, that was added. It's not actually a part of the musical. It was written specifically for this production, where two grandchildren come up to the attic looking for their grandmother Mary's story. Just a few lines to set up the attic, but then the entire Secret Garden story takes place in this cluttered attic, as if it's just a memory. And the different items of clutter in the attic become the different props and set pieces and all that sort of thing. And so in that way, this attic becomes Archibald's study, Mary Lennox's bedroom, Colin's bedroom, the various gardens, and of course the secret garden. And this is all done through the power of suggestion. I mean, the attic is still there, it's still very obviously there, but the audience believes that they are in these various settings because the actor suggests them, the lighting suggests them, and the various set pieces suggest them. And it's a perfect example of how stage can do this power of suggestion most effectively. And this got me thinking. Storytelling is essentially an act of imagination. I think that's why theater is so compelling in particular, because it relies a lot on imagination. There's literal storytelling too, but at a certain point you have to let the literal storytelling leave off and allow the imagination of the audience to pick it up. That's where the willing suspension of disbelief comes in. We know that we're watching a production, we know we're not actually watching something unfold, but because we have that willing suspension of belief, we allow ourselves to believe for the couple of hours that we're sitting in the theater that we are, in fact, watching real events unfold. And it also got me to thinking that there is a lot to be said for leaving things to the imagination. I think a lot of times in storytelling, particularly in television and movies, we get so caught up in creating a realistic atmosphere that we forget that storytelling is an act of imagination. And I think some of the most compelling stories are the ones that suggest certain events and suggest certain things happening rather than show them to us literally. For example, at the beginning of The Secret Garden, everybody except Mary Lennox dies of cholera. They die of cholera in the beginning of the stage version, but we don't actually see them dying. There are elements, symbolic elements, that suggest their death. In the original version, they had red handkerchiefs that they kind of cast off to show that they had died. In this production that I saw, they actually played a game of musical chairs, and as they disappeared, that was to suggest that they had died of cholera until only Mary was left. Let's take as another example the writings of Aaron Sorkin. I've talked about Aaron Sorkin to death, of course. He writes behind the scenes stuff and he's the creator of the show The West Wing. Oftentimes in The West Wing, an episode would center around a speech that the president had to make, like, say, the inauguration. There's a two-part episode that is basically a build-up to the president's inauguration, and in this speech that he has to give, of course, it's the inauguration, so it's a big deal already, but he's also announcing a radical new foreign policy. And so you've got two episodes of build-up going up to this inauguration, and then... They skip over the inauguration and go to afterwards. We don't actually hear the inauguration. The inauguration and the power of this groundbreaking speech is all left to our imagination. Because think about it, after all this build up, there's no way that an actual speech could possibly live up to what we are already creating in our minds. Take as another example an episode that aired just after Aaron Sorkin had left the series. This episode also had a build up to a big speech at the end, and then they actually showed us the speech, and it was underwhelming. Partly because John Wells, bless his heart all over the place, can't write speeches. Had they just left off and not actually had us listening to the speech, that probably would have been more powerful because it would have been left to our imaginations. I've been noticing this a lot too with graphic depictions of gore and violence. 
I recently read one of Alan Moore's graphic novels, The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Now, I've reviewed V for Vendetta, and I've reviewed Watchmen, and I love them both very much, but I was a little underwhelmed by A League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. And I think part of that has to do with the graphic depiction of violence. It seemed especially graphic in this graphic novel. Like, when somebody's brains are being bashed in, you actually see their brains being bashed in. And it's not that I'm squeamish and that I have a problem with gore and violence, but... I think that that sort of thing is a lot more powerful if you don't show every single aspect of it. Because once again, our imaginations are much more powerful than anything that's literally on paper or literally on the screen could conjure up. And so if you just suggest the violence in some way, then our imagination picks up where you left off and it becomes a lot more powerful than if you just show it to us. I really do think that storytelling is at its best when you suggest, when you imply, when you leave things to the imagination. So what do you think? Tell me what you think about imagination being such a key part of storytelling. How much or how little should imagination and suggestion play a part in storytelling? And if you do happen to live anywhere near Toledo, Ohio, I would highly encourage you to go to the Toledo Rep Theater, Google it, you'll find it, and see the last two weekends of The Secret Garden. It's playing this weekend and next weekend. Go see it. It's a little bit pricey if you're not a student, but it is well worth it. And that's all I have to say about that, and until next time... This is Uber Ren reminding you that no matter how pretty they are, no matter how much you want to test them out, never, ever roll a die in the store. It will be cursed forever. D&D &D nerd out.